By what name are you known? There are some who call me... Tim. Welcome to another episode of Timmy Talks, the channel where we talk old school magic. And welcome back to the Color Clash. We have reached the semi-finals. And in the semi-finals, we have two white decks for you. Remember, this is the Color Clash, meaning everybody that started this tournament, 55 wizards in total, started with a mono-colored deck. So in this semi-finals, the top four match, we have John versus Alex. Both of them are on mono-white decks. Both of them have very white weenie-ish decks. One may be a little bit more a control-ish deck, the other one more traditional aggro. Before I jump into that though, because in a moment I will start with the deck decks, I would first like to point out that as always, you can also choose to skip that section of the video, go straight to the games. The easiest way to do this is by checking out the description below. There you will find several timestamps. One timestamp reads, reads MTG Games. Click on there, it'll take you straight to the game action. And here I'm going to continue with the uh, the decks. And I'm going to start with the deck of John. Let's take a look at his version of Mono White. And here we see the white deck of John. Now we also saw this deck in action last week where it was victorious against Mono Blue. It simply went way too fast and the Crusades were super good in that matchup. I remember that the Deserts and the Timmies couldn't help uh, the opponent of John last week because the uh, the Crusade simply made the creatures too big. You know, a difference between one toughness and two toughness, that is a real thing. Talking about the Crusades, today it's going to be tough for John in that regard because yes, the Crusades pump his creatures, but remember, all white creatures get the bonus, so also the creatures of his opponent. So that's going to make those Crusades not as good. Another thing that's going to be not as good is, of course, the attack because his opponent will also play pretty aggressive so both players will go aggro so this this could lead to two things right maybe one player is more lucky and is able to play out way more creatures get the removal in the right time simply put on a lot of pressure and win the game or it's going to be one of those stare downs where you play savannah line the opponent plays savannah line and you're going to wait or i guess there's also a third option that you're just constantly going to have these combat situation situations where you trade off resources right and where maybe a balance can be decisive or perhaps in the, the case of John also a well-timed Armageddon who knows uh, a nice thing to mention in this deck what I said last week as well this deck is built according to the 202020 rule which means 20 creatures 20 spells and 20 lands which is something we all used to do back in the 90s so I think it's really cool John that you uh, you kept that tradition alive in today's uh, tournament it's really cool to see a deck do so well but like I said, some of the weapons that make your deck so good are not so good when you have this mirror match against another mono white deck. Let's take a look at that deck, by the way, the, uh, the deck of Alex. And here we see the mono white deck of Alex and you can already kind of see some, some differences, right? First of all, he's only playing with two Crusades and I think in this case, I mean, that is huge, right? Because the Crusades of, of John are going to work for his deck as well. So basically, they're playing with six Crusades. And that means that Alex has two spots more open for other creatures. For example, you know, Sarah Angels that we can see in this deck. We also see, by the way, Greater Realm of Preservation here in the main. You may think, why is, there, or is that card in the main board? That is because with the Color Clash, we do not play with sideboards. So you just have to make the choice to play it as main, right? And I think it's a good decision because this is a COP that protects you from the mono red and the mono black decks. Of course, it's gonna be useless in this matchup, but that is the risk that you take. Um, when we're looking at the whole thing, when we're looking at the whole list, I mean, of this deck, and we compare that to the list of John, uh, the first thing I noticed is that he's playing with a lot more flyers. So he's got the three Sarah Angels, but also the four Thunder Spirits. And he's also playing with the Mesa Pegasus, a card that uh, uh, John is also playing with. And then there are also some similarities, of course, Savannah Lines, White Knights, they both play. But we see Tundra Wolves here in the deck of uh, Alex, which is pretty sweet. And we also see a single um, Preacher. I think the Preacher could be really, really good in this match. You know, just stealing that one creature can be quite a uh, kind of important, kind of a big deal. On the other hand, of course, it is just one creature and both players are playing with four swords. So there are, of course, ways to get rid of the Preacher. But, you know, who knows? That's kind of like this more control-ish element that uh, that Alex has in the deck that could uh, could be good in this in this particular matchup in general I think yes this is also a very aggressive build but if you have to choose between John and Alex I would say John has the more aggressive build so Alex has like the more mid-range build and I think that's going to be an advantage for Alex because you know he can kind of keep up with the pace of John because they're both playing a lot of one drops they're both playing that aggro white strategy but then when the game takes longer 
Alex has some more weapons, like the Preacher, but also the Thunder Spirits, two two first strikers that can get huge with all those Crusades. And of course, he's got those Sarah Angels. So I think that's the advantage could tip a little bit towards Alex, but we'll simply have to wait and see. You know, on the other hand, perhaps the deck of John is even more consistent in just dropping out threats continuously if you compare that to the list of Alex. Anyway, it is really everybody's game here. I would say maybe 55% more chance that Alex wins purely because of the Sarah Angels. I don't know. Let me know in the comments below what you think. Anyway, uh, both players have a really high chance of making it to the finals. That is for sure. They're both uh, in the semifinals. And now we are ready to go to that semifinal match. Let's go to the semifinals of the Color Clash. Mono White versus Mono White. Game number one of the semifinals of the Color Clash is about to begin. Alex here on the play, starting with a Mistress Factory. Both players on Mono White. So we'll probably see a lot of action and fireworks in the early stages of the game. Look at this, a land text being played here by John. So it's interesting to see how Alex is going to respond to this. And look at that, he's doing nothing, he's just passing the turn. So he's going to wait and see, there's a Benali Shiro, and I'm just expecting exactly, I'm expecting John to also pass the turn, I mean, why shouldn't he? And there is again a pass by Alex. And this is in the advantage of John, of course, because he's got a creature and uh, Alex doesn't have the mana to animate that factory. There's another creature, another Benalish hero, the 1-1 one -one Bander from Alpha. Alex again passing the turn, it seems. Discarding even a card, a disenchant here. Wow, really doesn't want to uh, get that tax activated or simply doesn't have the mana in hand, but I think it's, uh, it's the first reason. So there's the attack for two here from, uh, from John, of course, and then the pass of the turn. So Alex dropping here to 17. Okay, there's a Pendlehaven. So perhaps he simply didn't have any land. I mean, it's possible. Passing the turn, now we have that tax activation. I mean, things are looking really good for John here in game one. Showing the three planes, that's going to go to his hand, so he will have 10 cards in hand and then draw for turn, we'll go to 11. Meaning he will have to discard a lot probably. Then again, he is playing white weenie, so he's probably able to and play a land and play something out. So there he's going to draw, so now he's got 11 in hand. If he drops a land, it means he also has enough mana to potentially cast a disenchant in response to the animation of Alex of his factory. He can see John thinking, okay, playing a factory, because I thought maybe he's thinking, do I want to play my, my land for turn? Because it does mean that then Alex has an option again to choose whether or not to activate my land tax. And if I don't play land, I know that I next turn can again look up three lands out of uh, out of my library. And it looks like he's gonna attack here, perhaps in a band. Or not, of course. Remember, both players playing with disenchants and swords to plowshares. Okay, tapping two here. What is he gonna cast for two? Okay, there's the blacksmith from Arabian Nights, a one-two creature with protection from red, which is of course not relevant in this matchup. But again, like I said in the deck tech section, for the color clash, we do not play with sideboards. So you have to make that decision. You can only play those cards main. So if you expect a lot of red decks, which of course were in the color clash tournament, then you can play with these cards. We also see Alex in his list. He's playing with the greater realm of preservation. Look at that, Alex. Discarding a Crusade, which is actually a perfect card to discard. You don't want to play it out, but it looks like Alex cannot find any white land. I, I thought he was simply not playing out anything because of the land tax on the side of John, but perhaps he simply doesn't have the planes in hand. There's another planes. And look at that, attacking with everything it seems. Yeah, exactly, using that one planes to animate the factory, going in it, kind of signaling that he has the swords to plowshares here. There's the swords. And I think if you're Alex, I mean, you gotta do it. Because if you take the damage, you're gonna fall so far behind. 
And of course, you're hoping that he doesn't have the swords, but like I said, you're kind of forced to. Anyway, he's taking the damage, so five points, also gaining two life because of the, uh, the factory. Ending up on 14, it seems. Passing the turn there. The, the screen of Alex is not super, but uh, I'll try to, uh, to talk you through it. This is a Mox Pearl, so he finally found a white source. I mean, he's really far behind now, you know? I mean, that's it with these aggro decks. You can get behind so fast if you stumble on your mana. Anyway, there's a Pegasus, the 1-1 flyer with banding. Beautiful art by Melissa Benson. There's the animate, of course, attack, attack, attack. It's all that uh, that John has to do here. And uh, this is so painful for Alice because he, he doesn't even have the luxury to keep his uh, Pendlehaven untapped to make that uh, Pegasus a 2-3. That would have been kind of ideal. At least he could have blocked a couple of creatures with it, but it's not meant to be. Even more pressure now, a white knight 2-2 first strike, pro-black. So yeah, this is just really tough here for Alex. Finding the Tundra Wolves. Okay, that's pretty sweet. He can make it a 2-3 with the Pendlehaven. And then he can basically kill the uh, the White Knight, for example. That's really nice. I always kind of felt that the Tundra Wolves should get a bonus when the Tundra is played. That would have been really nice. Like plus one, plus one or something. Then the card would see a lot more play. I love the art on Tundra Wolves. I believe it's Quinton Hoover. Now we're gonna see the attack or not. I mean, this is kind of tough here for John in, in the sense that if he attacks, he knows he's gonna have to potentially maybe lose a creature. On the other hand, he does have those Benalish heroes. So if he can make a good band, for example, he could put the White Knight together with the Benalish hero, have a 3-3 creature. That would be quite good. And then because it, it has banding, he can decide how the damage is going to be divided. Now remember, Alex also has a bander with the Pegasus, so he can band together with the Thunderwolves and of course use that Pendlehaven. So it is a little bit tricky, but I think it's really important for John to keep the pressure on. Remember, Alex already on nine. He's really in the tank here. Thinking about animating the factory perhaps. So it looks like he's gonna make two bands. This is kind of hard because we don't have audio. But remember, when you're attacking as a bander, you can only combine one bander with one creature. So I think the factory is attacking separate. Exactly, yeah, this is much better. Now we have a good overview. Thank you, John. So there's the 2-2 factory, and then we have the other two creatures in a band. So a 3-3 bander and a 2-3 bander. And remember, in the bands, John get to decide how the damage is divided. That's why banding is so good. So for Alex, it's kind of, you know, he's got some options. He could choose to kill the factory, block it with the Thunder Wolves, for example, and pump it with the Pendlehaven, and then perhaps jump block another creature. What he could also do is try to kill the 2-3 here, or at least one of the two creatures, probably the Banalish, and then take uh, four points of damage. I think I would probably kill the factory with the Thunder Wolves and take the four damage, go down to five, which is not ideal, but I don't think I would want to chump block with the Pegasus. Yeah, it looks like that's exactly what Alex is doing. So he's gonna take five damage. Okay, he is jumping to three, three. Taking two points, gonna go to seven. That makes sense as well. I mean, you don't want to go down to four, but Oh, there's a disenchant. Oh, that is so painful. Usually, you know, with, with the decks that both players are playing, you don't need a lot of mana, but you need at least one white mana if you're... Oh, there it is. There's the planes. I want to say you need at least one white mana if you're playing mono white, you know. It's pretty important. So here's at least the other white. Now, remember, Alex is also playing with, for example, four Thunder Spirits that he just simply cannot play out. He hasn't had two white mana this entire game one. So it's really bad fortune here for him, and... It's not looking good. John can now attack again in the same banding formation. Now he's gonna go separate. Okay, I like it. And Alex is probably gonna block the White Knight here, pumping the Thunder Wolves, make it into a 2-3, killing the Knight. But then, you know, he's still taking three points of damage, so he's gonna drop to four. 
Or is there a trick? Army of Allah. Oh man, I love this. This is such a well-timed play. So Army of Allah, I actually didn't discuss it in the deck deck. It's an instant from uh, Arabian Nights. It gives all creatures plus two plus O. Oh. All your creatures, that is. So that means that, uh, yeah, and there we go. Alex picking up the piece. He's actually basically dead because of the Army uh, Army of Allah. Actually, he is. Wow. Army of Allah victory. So it gives plus two plus O to all creatures. And that works so well with the White Knight because the White Knight has first strike. So, uh, yeah, pretty cool move here. The uh, the Army of Allah here uh, winning it for uh, for John in game uh, number one. Game number two. And as you can see, uh, we're kind of missing the uh, the first couple of turns here. I can tell you John played the planes. Well, actually, Alex was on the play. So Alex played the planes. John played the planes. And we're starting at turn two of Alex where he's cast a White Knight. So we haven't missed much here in game number two. It's really up to Alex here to win this or else he's out of the tournament. Remember, this is the semifinals. So the winner will advance to the finals of the color clash. Oh, White Knight stare down. White Knight day, White Knight day. Let's see what's gonna happen. Would be funny if Alex would not play a crusade. Then we've got two, three, three White Knights. There is a Pendlehaven that's not going to change much, but it could be pretty important later on. Remember, remember, Pendlehaven can give target one one creature plus one plus two. There's the attack. So Alex like offering to trade, and now let's see what John's going to do. Going through his hand, thinking, okay, do I want this trade? You know, if Alex is offering it, it's probably better for Alex. I wonder if he's going to play a Thunder Spirit next. There is the the block. So taking the trade, and then Alex, of course casting something else there's a thunder spirit now remember alex didn't have a single moment in game one where he actually had two planes on the battlefield so this must feel really good for him that he's able to play out stuff let's see what john can do here it looks like he's keeping uh, two lands here a land tax will be quite nice there's a land tax i mean both players are still on 20 this is not too bad here so Alex probably going to swing in here, put John on 18. And then let's see if he can, uh, you know, put some more pressure on. There's another planes, okay. So he's kind of thinking, you know what? You can have the land X activations, uh, John. I don't care. I'm just going to put a lot of pressure on the board. That's exactly what he does here. Two um, Tundra Wolves. And remember, those Tundra Wolves are 1-1, one, one, so they work with the Pendlehaven. And they also have first strike. So with that Pendlehaven, they can actually kill a White Knight, for example. And John here, of course, uh, using his stacks here, taking three lands out. Which is, I mean, that's pretty good. That's a big deal. It also means that uh, you're probably going to find a spell instead of a land from the top of your deck. So he's going to pick up the lands, draw for turn. So then he's got 10 cards in hand. There's another planes. Now remember, Alex, or sorry, John is not playing with Thunder Spirits. Actually, he doesn't have a lot of flyers, so the, the Thunder Spirits could be quite annoying for John. He does, of course, have four uh, swords to plowshare, so I mean, he's got weapons against it. There's a White Knight. So this is now interesting for Alex, because Alex has that Pendlehaven, so he can actually at attack with the Thunder Wolves and doesn't have to worry about the White Knight. So there's the untap. And I'm expecting Alex just to go all in now. Why shouldn't he? Yeah, exactly. There's the attack. And actually, Crusade would now be pretty bad for Alex because then he can no longer use the Pendlehaven. So that could be a consideration for John as well. Look at that. John taking all the damage. We don't see the pump, though, with the Pendlehaven. Interesting. He's going to tap five, Sarah Angel. Sarah Angel. Ah, oh, this is really tough. Now, John needs removal because this is getting out of hand here. This is really bad news. The only good thing that John is going for himself here is to tax, but that's not going to be enough. A balance will be really nice now, by the way. That would be quite nice. Not for the hand size of John, but it would really take care of some creatures on the board. But I think just the simple sorts would already help him a lot. He could take care of the Sarah Angel then at least. I mean, this is really tough uh, tough for John, also because he cannot even use the White Knight to block the Tundra Wolves with because of that single Pendlehaven. 
and also well sequenced of course by Alex to first go and attack with the Pendlehaven untapped and then second main phase playing out that Sarah Angel. There's another planes, tapping two here. Okay, there's a Pegasus, so at least he can chum block. There's a Benelli Shiro, but no swords though. Swords, of course, being an instant, so perhaps he's just waiting for the right moment. He really, really, really needs a swords. And the Benelli Shiro is quite nice, because that, that means that the John can now block in a huge band. So that can help him uh, negate some damage, potential damage from a, a pumped up uh, Thunderwolves. So I wonder if Alex is now also just going to continue attacking with the Thunderwolves. I would be tempted to, to be honest. I mean, worst case scenario, you would still trade a Thunderwolves for a 1-1 on the side of, uh, of John, which is not too bad. Looks like Alex is a little bit in the tank here, so probably trying to do the maps. It's hard with uh, both players playing with banding. At least Alex doesn't have any banding at the moment, but remember banding and defense that you only need one banding creature to put all your creatures in the band. So just attacking with the two flyers, it seems, keeping the wolves at home. That's good for six damage. I mean, all John can do is jump if, if he wants, but I guess that's a little bit too early in the game. He's still on 14, so probably just gonna take the six gonna drop all the way to eight I mean the air I mean Alex is so strong in the air compared to John's list the thunder spirits the Sarah angels and I think that's gonna be really decisive don't forget though John is still up a game I mean one swords can already make a lot of difference here both players haven't played a single swords yet it's really time now for John though to step it up. So he's on eight, gonna draw his card for turn. So he probably has 11 cards in hand at the moment. And neither player is playing with the Wrath of God, by the way. Wrath of God is another card that would be really nice against these type of decks. Of course, the problem is for both players, they're both playing pretty creature heavy, so that's probably why they're not playing with the Wrath of God. Five mana here for John, but remember, he doesn't play with Sarah Angel. His strategy is really low to the ground, White Weenie Classic, just, you know, play a lot of smaller creatures, pump them with Crusades, and just get a lot of damage in very quickly. Something that hasn't been uh, working for, for John this second game. The first game, of course, it was. Yeah, things are going so well for Alex. He doesn't really have to think here. Just gonna attack with the uh, flying forces again. Sarah Angel Thunder Spirit into the red zone. And I guess it's time to chump for John here. Does he want to take six? Go to ten uh, to two. Exactly. He's gonna chump the Sarah. I assume. Exactly. Gonna drop to six. I mean, if you're John, you gotta play towards your outs. Who knows? Maybe you're gonna find something. No tax activation here since both players have five. Nope, that's it. John unable to find the swords to plowshares. That means it's 1-1 one, one, and we're going to go to game number three. Game number three. Here we go. At the end of this game, we will know who is going to the finals. Is it going to be John here on the play or will it be Alex? Both starting with the planes. Alex finding a soul ring. Okay, haven't seen that in this uh, match thus far. Remember, in this tournament, all artifacts are restricted and you can only play with eight. There is a white knight being played by John. Passing turn here to Alex. Let's see what Alex can do. He's got four mana already. He's playing with three Sarah Angels. We saw the Sarah being very decisive in, uh, in game number two. Looks like Alex is not doing anything or not. For a moment, I thought he passed a turn to John. Looks like he's a little bit in the tank here. There are a lot of things he can do with four mana. Also playing with one JM Daytone, by the way. Gonna tap a planes, it seems, and the soul ring, so three mana in total. 
Okay, there's a Mesa Pegasus, so the 1-1 one -one flyer with banding. Both players playing with that card, by the way. It's a card you actually don't see a lot, also in white weenie decks. It is quite good, of course, that, that flying and banding uh, option. Taking a damage here from Mana Burn, because we are playing with Mana Burn in this format. Almost forgot about that, but we do have Mana Burn here. There's the attack with the White Knight. So Alex, ooh, there's a Swords to Plowshares. I won't say Alex take two damage, but no, he's not playing out the Swords. So John going up to 22, but losing the Knight. There's his own Pegasus. Passing the turn to Alex. So let's see if Alex is gonna offer to trade here. He did earlier in uh, in game one, I believe, where they traded White Knights. Tapping four. Okay, there's that Jam Day Tome I talked about. That Tome could be pretty decisive. Obviously, John playing with Disenchants, but if John cannot find the Disenchant, uh, the Tome is looking really, really good in this matchup. Also, because John has no way of, uh, of drawing any additional cards. Well, I guess that's not completely true, though, because he does play with land tech. So land tech, of course, is a way to kind of thin your deck, take out the lands, meaning you're probably going to find spells. Right now, both players have three basic lands, by the way. So even if John has a land tech in hand, you probably don't want to play it out yet. You don't want to let Alex know that you have it until you're... Uh, you're behind on Lance. Okay, there's a disenchant. Yeah, this is this is really good. I guess now the decision is, are you gonna go for the Soul Ring or for the book? This is gonna go for the book. So another option could have been go for Soul Ring and maybe take the gamble that Alex is uh, low on Lance and then he cannot use the Gem Day Tome. But this is of course the safer and probably the better way to go. Just take care of the book. There's the attack, so offering the trade. I wonder if that means that he has a Sarah Angel or Thunder Spirit that he can play out now in his second main. So John going to 21. Okay, there's a White Knight. 2-2 two -two first strike pro black. Both players playing with the White Knight. Tapping three. There's another Pegasus, so he's gonna take another damage from Mana Burn, dropping to 18. John still on 21. And it looks like we have a real game on our hands here. More and more creatures going to get played out by both players, kind of clogging up the board. There's the Savannah Lines by John. Two planes, three planes now untapped. Three cards in hand. It looks like John is passing the turn. And John now having the higher life total, but really kind of, you know, stuck in defense mode. Two Pegasuses for Alexander, and of course that uh, White Knight. I would probably just attack with all of it, you know, why not? Make some trades. Could of course also choose to band. Exactly, just attacking with everything. I wonder if he's attacking the, putting the Pegasuses in a band. Doesn't really matter that much. I would probably attack separately because then at least you take a damage in. There's a block in a band. But I mean, that doesn't really work, does it? I mean, he could, he could block in a band on the White Knight, but then he'll lose. Yeah, he could put all the damage on the Pegasus and then the Lion can kill the White Knight. That is true. Okay, yeah, that's actually pretty well played. So that is a really good trade here for... Uh, for John here, taking care of the White Knight with just one Pegasus. That was some uh, some good blocking. Taking full advantage of that banding ability of the Pegasus. Attacking here, Alex for two and another Pegasus. And now it's looking much, much better for, for John after that block, I have to say. Passing to turn here. I'm expecting Alex to, well, expecting he could consider attacking again with both. Offering a trade. Problem is then, of course, you've got that Lion coming at you. There's the attack for two. So he's going to drop to 17, not blocking. Alex being on 16, tapping three. Oh, there's a Thunder Spirit. Yeah, this uh, this can change a lot here. This Thunder Spirit is really good because it can also, of course, block the lines. Got first strike. John can, of course, consider attacking in a band again. 
That would put Alex in kind of an awkward position because you don't want to block with the Thunder Spirit then, because then you're trading the Thunder Spirit for the, uh, the Pegasus, right? You don't really want to do that. So you probably are just going to take the damage drop to 13. But then again, if you're John, do you really want to attack? Because it means you're opening yourself up. I guess it's all about what uh, what John has in hand here. I mean, if he doesn't attack, he's basically keeping his Pegasus on blocking duty and he could trade it for another Pegasus, but that's about it. That's not a lot of value either, so... Or either, sorry, I should say. Tapping the white. Okay, this changes a lot. Swords to plowshares. That is pretty good. So Alex going up to 18, but more importantly, that... Uh, Annoying Thunder Spirit is gone. Ooh, there's a Crusade. This is a risky play, but I like it. Attacking with both, so now he deals five points of damage. So Alex is gonna drop to 13. And John, of course, taking a risk playing against the other mono white player. Now remember, this is without sideboard, so there's no moment in the game where you can actually take these Crusades out. You're gonna be stuck with them, and you have to find the right moment. I do like this play by John. It is risky, but you gotta do what you gotta do. Alex has, I believe, then five cards in hand looking at the blue dice. That's quite a lot compared to the cards in hand from by John. John only having two cards in hand, it seems. Attacking with one Pegasus, which is now a 2-2. So John dropping to 15, Alex still on 13. Ooh, this is really good now for uh, for Alex finding this White Knight 3-3 first striker because of the Crusade. So it can kill the Lion. And remember, Alex has the Pegasus untapped, so he can also block in a band. John can, of course, attack in a band, but that block in a band is very valuable for Alex. It means he can put all damage if he wants to on one of the two creatures. And then uh, the other one survives, guaranteed. So there's the pass here by John deciding not to attack. That kind of makes sense. But this is not easy for uh, for John. So Alex could now, if he wants to attack with both Pegasuses, or just go with the single one. Yeah, attacking with both here. He can attack in a band. And then if John blocks, he can divide the damage, one damage on each Pegasus, so they both survive. So that would be bad news for John. Does he want to take four points of damage? He would drop to 11. I think he's got no choice, really. I mean, blocking is really not an option because they are in a band. It's now a 4-4 bander. Flying through the air, so he cannot use the Lion to block. Only has that Mega Pegas Mesa Pegasus to block with. Three cards in hand, and he's gonna drop. I think I would have done the same, dropping to 11. Let's see what Alex can do second main. There's another planes. Remember, John is playing with, uh, with Armageddon, but hasn't really been able to find the right moment to play it. Ooh, another crusade. So all the white creatures getting Plus two, plus two. I'm a little bit surprised that Alex is doing it in his second main. Uh, the reason that I'm surprised is that now, of course, John is the first person to kind of take advantage of this second crusade. I think if he would have played it first main, he could have attacked and dealt even more damage to John. So now uh, John Ditter's Savannah line is a 4-3 and the Pegasus is a 3-3. But remember, the White Knight of Alex is also a 4-4 first striker. So that's huge, of course. Again, he can consider attacking in a band. The problem is that he's opening himself up to tons of damage the following turn. So you only want to attack here. It looks like he's going to attack, though, with the single Pegasus. I think it's a good decision if you don't want to block anyway. You know what I mean? Like, if you've decided, as, as being as John, I'm not going to block the Pegasus in a band then attack, you know, because you're not going to use the Pegasus anyway. The only thing now is though, that of course, Alex can also swing in with the White Knight. He is giving kind of that opening. 
So Alex here drawing another card. And it's looking pretty bad for John. If he can find another swords, I mean, that would make a huge difference. Alex here attacking. So two Pegasuses and the White Knight, I assume not in a band now. Because John has no flyer. So I could just attack separately. So that's six, that's nine points of damage. No, that's 10 points of damage coming at John now. And John has to make a tough decision. Does he want to put his line in front of the bus? This is really difficult here for John. It would be a bad trade, but then again, do you really want to go to one? Ooh, does he have something? Tapping two, what could it be? There's a disenchant. Okay, taking care of one of the crusades, probably. To kind of stop the bleeding a little bit. But it's still a lot of damage though. Six points of damage. No, nine, uh, sorry, seven of course. Because the white knight is a three, three. So he's gonna drop to four. There we see another Savannah lines by Alex. It's looking really, really good for Alex. And that means it's looking really, really bad for John here. On four life, one, one, the winner will move on to the finals of the color clash. Where they will have to play against a mono blue combo deck. And we've seen, of course, Mono White win against Mono Blue in this tournament before because uh, Mono White simply goes too fast despite all the power cards in blue. So Mono White definitely stands a chance in that final. It looks like Chan is gonna attack again. I mean, there's is there an out here for John? Another Crusade, I love it. Problem here is that uh, that he's on 10 though. Maybe he also has an army of Allah. So we've got four seven damage. And then with army of Allah, he can actually kill. He can, he can kill Alex, but all that Alex has to do here, and I'm sure he's gonna do it, is chump with the lion. What if he doesn't chump with the lion? Exactly, chump with the lion. And John, please show us that army of Allah. I'm sure you had it. Yeah, I love it, love it, love it. He had that army of Allah. And the problem, of course, was he drew into too many crusades. And that works both ways. We talked about that in the deck tech section as well. That is unfortunate. But I did love that one attack. If Alex would have made the mistake, which of course he doesn't. But if he would have, he could have cast that army of Allah and win with the army of Allah. Just like he did in game number one. So that was really, really sweet to see. But uh, congratulations here to Alex for moving on to uh, the finals of the Color Clash. That is really cool. And like I said, the Color Clash is going to be uh, to go between Combo Blue and White Weenie. Or actually more, this is more mid-range white, isn't it? It's not like your traditional White Weenie. But uh, these two decks are going face-to-face uh, -face in the finals. Now, if you don't want to miss a thing, uh, please make sure to hit that subscribe button and ring that bell. So uh, that you're always informed when I put a new video online and you can follow uh, all the tournaments here on Timmy Talks on the Timmy Talks channel, of course, as well. And uh, talking about that, please leave a like, share, uh, leave a like, a comment and share this video on one of your socials if you want to, because uh, all that helps the channel move forward. So I would be super thankful if you would uh, take the time to do those uh, three easy things. And there's one last thing that you can do, and that is become a patron of the show. As a patron, you're supporting Timmy Talks financially, and so you're helping me continue making content for you. And uh, you can already become a patron for just $1 a month. And for that dollar, you get access to the Timmy Talks Discord, and your name will be mentioned in the end scroll at the end of every single video, including this one. Let's go to the end scroll. What shall we do with the drunken sailor?
to Sumba Kazik.